It's great to see everyone this morning. It's always a good day on Sunday when we can all get together and sing praises to God and talk about all the, the I can't even see those people. Hi. <laughs> Talk about all the good things that are going on, and uh, certainly God is full of good things and blessings. Um, it's warming up, weather's nice out, enjoy this time of year, it's beautiful around. So, it's the best time for Arizona. So, we want to talk today a little bit about bigger barns and better people. If you hadn't noticed, we're going through Luke and just kind of looking at some of the teaching that Luke has for us. And what does that really mean? How does all of that work? And so as you look at the passage that's been read, there is a person or two people who come and say, you know, tell my brother to divide the inheritance between us. I don't know how long this had been going on. Uh, it might have been for several years. I don't know if it's a recent death in the family, but certainly there's an inheritance. Uh, my brother needs to divide it. In other words, I'm not getting enough. I need more. And so that's what they're doing is being able to look at this. And so tell him to divide the inheritance. There is a conflict that goes on. And there is a struggle between brothers. And he appeals to Jesus to solve this argument. Now, this is what we would like to do in every case, right? No matter when we have any kind of a conflict or any kind of a issue, we should ask Jesus. Jesus will solve all conflicts with all of us, correct? And yet, Jesus' response is, well, who made me the judge? Well, God did, right? I mean, isn't Jesus going to be the judge? 2 Corinthians 5.10, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God or the judgment seat of Christ. And so as you look at that passage and you look at what he's saying here, it's like, well, Jesus, you're supposed to be judge over all of us. You're supposed to decide all these things. And anything that we have, we ought to be able to come to you and say, you know, you judge between us and we'll get everything worked out because you're going to offer all judgment. And Jesus says, no, I am not. What? What do you mean you're not? He says, I am not going to deal with all the little squabbles you guys get into. I am not going to deal with all the things about whether you're supposed to have this or you're supposed to have that. Who had it first? How much do you get? How much? Are... He says, that's not what being judge means. That's not why I came. And he isn't here to judge between people. He is here to judge for a different reason. He's not here to settle all of our arguments. And so if you're thinking it would be good to have him come and settle your arguments, I think his next section of what he is teaching because of this may help us out a little bit with that. And so he says, I want you to guard against all kinds of covetousness, all kinds of wanting what the other person has. Because that's one of the most dangerous things. And so anytime you're trying to guard, he says, I want you to guard against being in a place where you want what somebody else has. Things are not fair. It's not going right for me. It's, he says, guard against covetousness first. Well, we think God is fair, right? God wants to be fair. God wants everything to be fair. He makes the world fair. Wait. No, he really doesn't do that, does he? Um, that's our concept of what it should be like, and we tend to invent God in the way we would like him to be. And yet, Jesus indicates clearly life isn't going to be fair. God isn't trying to get it to be fair. And that's not what it's all about. He says, let me tell you a story. And don't we love it when he begins to tell us a story? And so he tells this story about barns. And he says there's a rich man who has lots of land, and he has a bumper crop. He has all kinds of wheat that has grown or whatever it is that he's producing, and it is his best year ever. 
it has just done more than he ever expected. He has so much, and God has blessed him so much because isn't that where it all comes from? And so God is the one who has blessed him so much. He says, now I don't know what to do with it all because I have so much, I don't really have the room for it in the barn. I'm sure this is what his barn looked like. And so there's not enough room in the barn. And so what am I going to do with this problem of having too much of a good thing? Have you ever had that before? Too much of a good thing? Uh, I mean, usually we get too many bad things, but this is too much of a good thing. What a problem to have. And so he says, I know what I will do. It's a space problem, right? And so I will tear down that barn and I will build a bigger barn. Because obviously it's a space problem. That's what I need is more space. Is that why Jesus tells the story? Well, no, it doesn't really seem to fit the occasion and say, well, you need a bigger barn? No. And he's not very helpful with, or the guy he's talking about is not really the hero in the story. And so maybe he's telling the story because it's an attitude problem, not a space problem. But we tend to approach things logically and say, well, it must be just a space problem. And, well, I think there's a lot more to it than that. And so he says, you know, maybe it's an attitude problem. So I'll say, you know, God, I've got lots of goods and I've got things that I can store up for many years. I will have everything I need. I can relax. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And what's wrong with using what you've earned after all? I mean, you ought to store it, you ought to protect it, you ought to keep it because God gave it to you. God blessed you with it. He wanted you to have it. And so now it's yours and you ought to be a good, responsible steward to take care of all the blessings you have by protecting them from all those other people out there and keeping them safe because after all, God is blessing you. If he had wanted them to be blessed, he would have blessed them. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> Because that's not why he gives it to us. He gives it to us so that we are also able to bless other people. But it's real easy to get this twisted around, isn't it? Where we think what happened is, well, God bless me, and so God wants me to have it. No, God bless me, so he wants me to be the one who's able to minister to other people. And so Bigger Barns is not about, or it, Bigger Barns is about keeping and protecting what we have, making it ours, making that we own it. And he says that's not really what it's all about. That leads you back to the covetousness. That leads you back to the wanting what's mine. We think that if we can hang on to it, that that's going to be great, that's going to be good. But that's never the case, is it? You can never just hang on to where you are and to what you have. In fact, if you try to hang on to money, you've got that same $100 bill that you've been saving since 1963. It's worth $100. Will it buy the same amount now as it would have in 1963? Not at all. Not in any way. And so the fact that you have hung on to it and saved it for yourself means you have lost. Because inflation goes crazy, everything else takes it, and we didn't really get ahead by that, even by our own logical standard. Do you remember when you used to play a musical instrument? And you think, oh, I can just pick it up again. I used to play a trumpet. Long time back, it, this has been quite a few years ago. Oh, well, there's a trumpet. Well, I remember how to play that. I can, oh, it's awful. It's like you're right back at day one. 
So any of the skills we think we have, we're going to save it. We're going to keep it. We're not going to let everybody else have it. We're just going to, as soon as you try and hang on to it, you start losing. The blessings of God are not for us to hang on to. They're for us to be able to share, for us to do. And it doesn't matter whether it's money. It doesn't matter whether it's skills or talent. We are to be able to share that with somebody else. God gave it to us to use for other people. It's not really about keeping it for us. And so the guy who wants to say, well, my brother has all the money. Give me mine. Give me mine. You've you're got the wrong attitude here. And we need to look at this a little bit differently. And the big point that he says is you really need to be rich toward God. He says, and it's not about trying to be rich for yourself. It's not about, now take care of yourself right. But we need to be rich toward God. And so how can we take what God gave us and make ourselves rich toward God. You see, we can always build bigger barns. We can be caught up in this life. We can take care of what we are owed. We can build bigger barns. It's only logical because we're going to approach life from a logical point of view, and that is not what God is trying to say here. Success is about having the most, having the best, right? No, it really isn't. The argument is about dividing the inheritance. And if you get what you are owed and lose your brother, you have not gained anything. And so it's not about the inheritance. The inheritance is not worth fighting for. And God does not seem to care about how much of the little stuff we get in trying to divide your stuff, my stuff. Because by the time you get to the end... Somebody's got to take care of that stuff. And you're going to wish somebody would just come and take it away. And so take care of yourself, yes. Divide with your brother, yes. Be fair, yes. But that's really not what life is about. It's the treasure in your heart. And that's what makes all the difference. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And we really can be better people, not just people with bigger barns. We really can focus on God because it's not about our possessions, not about what we have. Later on in that same chapter, in Luke chapter 12, we see in verse 29, he's talked about don't be anxious about your life in the middle. And now in verse 29, he says, And do not seek what you are to eat or what you are to drink, nor to be worried, for all the nations in the world seek these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, and where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so he says, don't seek, don't make that the main focus and obsession of your life to be about what you want to eat or drink or what you need to worry about. He says, God knows you need all those things. Everyone in the world wants those things. We all understand that. Having more will solve all of our problems, right? If I just had more, that's all I need is just a little bit more. And it's amazing how many times we fall into that trap is, I know I've got a lot right now, but God, I just need a little bit more. And if I had just a little bit more... Well, if you have a little bit more, you're going to pay taxes on it. That's coming up real quick here. If you have a little bit more, you're going to have to take care of it. You're going to have to insure it. You're going to have to, and it doesn't quite end. 
And so that's not what it is about. He says, I want you to seek the kingdom and everything else is going to be added. Because God knows. Because God sees. And that means God will give me the more? No. That means God will give you what you need. And you'll be able to work with that. But I wanted the more. Well, no, that's, you'll get the kingdom. You seek first, make that your obsession, make that the most important thing in life. And let God work out the rest of this. It isn't always about how we save money or how we deal with things. It may be about how we spend it. He says, don't make it about your possessions. He says, give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags by helping other people, by investing, by spending, not by keeping it saying, okay, I should be good now because now I have more. Because God's blessings are not for us. He gave it to us to give to other people. And so look for the kingdom first. Be kingdom people first. Because after all this statement is true. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. And Jesus' answer to the whole situation seems to be, seek first the kingdom of God. That's what's most important. Well, that should be an easy thing, right? How would we seek first the kingdom of God? How would we want to go about that? How would we be better people rather than people who just argue about inheritance? Well, one of the people that I think we can look at that has this is Paul. Because much of the rest of the New Testament is written by him, and it's written by a guy who has been there before. He had the more. You can look at the list of accomplishments, and goodness, that's impressive, I mean, he is part of the council. He is one of the ruling class. He is one of the Pharisees. He's one of the main people that is in government and ruling over all of the people. And he has a very high standing. He's very well thought of by every single other person. And he's a very angry, angry person who wants to destroy everything Christians have. And so he goes from being an angry, violent Jew to being an apostle of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, he writes this about that change. He has said, the love of Christ is going to control me, and now therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was re reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an incredible statement he's making here. And all of this, as you read it all together, is just impressive that Paul has been able to put all of this together. So he says, anybody in Christ is a new creation. We started over. The love of Christ controls us. We're a new creature. And so there's been a new beginning. And the reason is because Christ is reconciling the world to himself. He d came here and lived his life and died on a cross, and he's not counting our sins against us because he is the one who took our place. He is the one who paid for our sins. And we are able then to share that message that he's the one who took away all of the blame, all of the shame, all of the things that are against us that would say we're terrible, awful people and made us into someone who's good, made us into better people, made us into kingdom people, made us into new creation, made us into people who love God, who are able to do great things 
for God. And certainly Paul goes on to that. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin, even though he had never sinned, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And then we can share his glory. And then we can be one with each other. Seems like it should be easy, right? After all, I think God has done most of it for us. He's the one who loved us. He's the one who has drawn us. He is the one who has said, I will not only provide the sacrifice in the way, it's just a matter of you accepting and believing that Jesus is the Son of God and being able to follow him. It's a matter of making that covenant with God by our repentance and our baptism into Christ and into his death. And then he forgives our sins and he takes it all away and we just come to church, right? We just live that Christian life by coming to church. How easy could this be? It's very simple, right? It's like when your kid says, can we have a dog? And you go, no. Well, why not? It'll be easy. And you know in the back of your mind, this is not going to be easy. It's real simple, all you have to do is give it food and water, and there's no problems. Yeah. Other than it's not housebroken. And you're going to have to put, and there's stuff that gets chewed up, and, and we, yeah, it's not easy. It should be easy. Why isn't it? Just like it should be easy raising kids right? What's so hard? Two-year-olds and teens, they're easy to do, right? You just give them a little food, give them a little water, there's a roof over their head, you're going to let them grow up in your house, you have provided everything for them, you'll send them to school where everybody else teaches them about all the things they're supposed to know. It should be easy, Why not? Why do we know there's going to be some problem with that? Because they're trying to get from two years old to 21. And to get from two years old to 21, there's a lot of struggle that's going to go on. Now, if they could still act like two-year-olds when they're 21, it might be easier they can just throw that temper tantrum anytime they want something and you'll give it to them, right? Yeah, they're going to try that one. Don't be surprised at it because they are going to try that one. But what's so hard? Well, what's so hard is at two years old, they're not mature yet. They're not developed yet. And their favorite thing to tell you is, I do it myself. And you need to let them. And that's what they're going to say until they're 21 at least. I do it myself. You let me do it myself. I want to have the car. I do it myself. <laughs> no, you're driving my car now. <laughs> there is a huge struggle in this development and I hope you can see that. I hope you can realize that because that's what Jesus is talking about with all of this. It's in how do we get this struggle of becoming a kingdom person to be this mature person in Christ. How do we get from the struggle of being an angry Jewish ruler to being the guy who writes 2 Corinthians 5 and 6. And he's going to try to write about this struggle that goes on because it's not an easy struggle. It is a violent change. And it makes violence inside of us. Our sins are being put out. We have to do away with them. We are destroying them from within. And sometimes we lash out at other people about it. And sometimes it's hard to change where we are to be someone different. 
And I think we see that all the time. Have you ever been in a peaceful church? Well, sure. It's easy, right? We just come here and we sit and we worship and everything is good. And we believe in peace and we preach peace. But you know what? Trying to get us from where we have been with our past to be this spiritual, mature person in Christ is a violent struggle. And it takes a lot of help. It takes everyone to be able to make it happen. But God makes peace. And so it is peaceful. And I'm amazed it works as well as it does. Because we do struggle with each other, and God does some amazing things to reconcile us to God. And lest we think that is a very simple, simple thing of, okay, my sins are forgiven, we're good. No, your sins are forgiven, you're good, and now we begin with the next day. And how do you live this out? Look at what Paul says as he writes the rest of this in 2 Corinthians 6. This is immediately following the other passage. He says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in affliction, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Does that sound like a struggle? And that's the answer to the guy who says, divide the inheritance. We are servants of God. And so what do we talk about? What do we brag about? And Paul's saying, you know, it could be about your baptism or it could be about your money or about your position or about your power. He says, I want to show you what life is like because here are some of the things that go on in this process of reconciliation to God and how it all takes a place. He says, this is how it all works. There are obstacles in afflictions, in hardships, in calamities. He talks about imprisonments, tumults, labors, all kinds of things, riots, sleepless nights, hunger, because suffering and attacks of other people outside are intense. They don't want you to live right. They don't want you to change, and it is hard to deal with all the suffering. Anytime we do something, there are difficulties that we're going to run into. And the same thing is true in Jesus. He says it also comes because of our character. It's in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in this genuine love that we're able to develop. And there is a lot to building this character inside of us. And part of the building of this character inside of us is about that patience, is about that purity. It's about, how do you get patience? Yeah, you just have to wait for it, which is really what patience is. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> And that's how we do it because, but a lot of things in here are not easy to do. Holding your tongue is not easy to do. Holding your temper is not easy to do, but that's part of what the patience is. And it's about living for Christ and things just don't happen immediately. It takes some practice. 
And he says it's by the things that we say. It's by truthful speech, by the power of God, by weapons of righteousness. And so how we think and about how we speak and how we fight against evil and we fight for our forgiveness, we fight for our redemption because that old person inside of us has to die and we live a new self and we go through it all with all of the contrasts that we see in life, the things that are not fair. It's glory and dishonor, evil report and good report. Yet we're deceivers and yet true. And you look at all the things he talks about that are contrasted, about how people see him and about what's going to be coming up as unknown yet well-known, as dying but we live, as punished but we're not dead yet, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor but making many rich. Yeah, there's your answer. That's what you do. Divide the inheritance. Will you use it to make many rich as having nothing, yet possessing everything? And as Paul looks at all of these different things, we look at this and go, wow, that's terrible. I don't want to do that. Where did he get all of this harsh treatment? Well, if you read what he wrote, it happened in church. Some from inside of church, some from outside of church. It happens on both sides. Because we are trying to get Christ formed in each other. And we make each other better people by the struggle that we have together. And it might be like trying to live with a two-year-old for a while. It is going to be a struggle, but we are going to make it. We are going to get through this. And we work hard to be who Jesus wants us to be. And that's really what has to happen. Maybe you've been fighting yourself. And you really need forgiveness. You really need this reconciliation to God. You really need to get rid of that old person that's in you. You really need to be this new creation so that you can see what everyone else is trying to tell you and what they're wanting you to be and wanting you to do. And we teach each other how to be better people, how to spread the word of God. We teach our children. We give compassion to those who are hurting. And so when he asks about dividing an inheritance, we have a great inheritance. But this is better, having nothing yet possessing everything. It's all bound up in the redemption of Christ, and we get the inheritance of heaven, and we are conformed to the heart of Jesus because God supplies, and the fullness comes from God, not from having bigger barns, not from having all the stuff that we need. You see, inheritance is not divided. The inheritance is multiplied. As soon as you start trying to divvy all the stuff up and make it all come out even and make everybody have a fair share, inheritance is not divided. But when you share it with somebody else, it gets multiplied. They don't take away any of yours. You share this grace of God and they just get more and you don't lose any. It spreads to more and more. And so it's not about splitting up the stuff we got on earth so we can store it in a barn somewhere. It's about sharing heaven. It's about helping kids grow up, going from two-year-olds to adults. And it's a fight to grow up, to become a mature person. But that's really where we are, isn't it? And we are in this together. And that's what you have to say as you look at your kids. Well, I guess these are mine. 
You can't trade. You realize that? Nobody's going to trade with you. Seems like a good idea sometimes, but their kids really aren't any better. And so this is us. And we are ready to work and we are ready to do things together. We're ready to go through COVID together. We're ready to learn together. We're ready to share together. We are ready to be that kingdom of God that Jesus is building here on earth. And maybe you've had struggles lately and you need this redemption. You need us to be able to share this inheritance. We would love to do that with you. If there's anything we can do to help make this better, whether it starts with baptism or whether it's about a prayer that says, I'm fighting for my life here, then come while we stand and sing.